Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. In the heights of the golden age of Hollywood, Kay Francis personified glamour itself. She was a tall, sophisticated woman, sublime at her craft, and one who conquered Hollywood at the tender age of 25. Why was Kay Francis considered a box office poison? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Kay Francis, the screen star who couldn't wait to be forgotten. Kay Francis was a tall, stunningly beautiful woman with a slight lisp who by all accounts should have never been the star that she was. Always immaculately and glamorously dressed in the highest fashion, Kay was a woman not to be reckoned with at her prime. She worked hard at honing her craft as an actress, did more than the publicity required, and proved that hard work does pay by not only conquering Hollywood in just two years, but by doing so by the age of 25. Born into a singing-acting family, Catherine Edwina Gibbs was on the stage in her toddlerhood, appearing in one of her mother, Catherine Clinton's, plays. Given the acting genes already in her blood and her early exposure to public applause and adoration, it's little wonder that she became an actress. What is so amazing is how long she took to decide to become an actress, and then the speed with which she rose through the ranks to the top. Kay's father, Joseph Gibbs, a six-foot-five-inch tall, successful businessman who left the family before Kay was four, forced her mother back to work as an actress. When the money was coming in from her mother's acting work, Kay was sent to Catholic school and even for a while to an upstate New York finishing school. When there was no money, Kay went to the local public schools. This money-no-money -money cycle was to be a motif for the rest of her life. While Kay dabbled in school plays, she first shunned the stage at 15 for a year at the Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School, the place where young ladies went on their way to becoming private secretaries or stenographers. Once her course was completed, Kay skipped all of this banal work, and this sophisticated teenager managed to obtain not only a job in a real estate office, but was selling real estate and arranging parties for the socialites of New York within months of graduating. It was at one of these extravagant soirees that she had organised that Kay met James Dwight Francis, the son of a wealthy New York family, the first of her five husbands. It was a whirlwind romance, with Kay becoming a married woman at just 17 years old. The marriage was as short as it was turbulent, and very soon Kay was sailing off to France to obtain a scandalous free divorce. And while she was there, she met and married Bostonian William Gaston, a Harvard athlete that swept her well and truly off her feet during her trip to Paris. Gaston needed to return to his law practice in Boston and his new wife, finding herself without the need to work, decided to follow in her mother's footsteps and grace the stage with her beauty. With her new connections this proved to be easy and she premiered in 1925 on Broadway in the show Queen of Players, a modern adaptation of Hamlet as Catherine Francis. Kay wrote in her diaries at this time that she got these parts by lying a lot to the right people, although some suspect she was laying with as much as she was lying to these right people. She had the attention of producer Stuart Walker at any rate, and he hired her for his travelling repertoire company, Portmanteau Theatre Company. They travelled to American Midwest cities, where Kay had a chance to try everything from walk-on parts to being the main feature, which gave her experience that she needed. Kay already had the looks. Returning to the city, Kay has two years of experience under her slim-fitting belt and had her first Broadway hit as the second lead in the stage drama Crime, which starred Sylvia Sidney, who claimed Kay stole the show from her. Kay was starting out on her way to the top. This success led to her being cast as an aviator in Rachel Crowther's play Venus, quickly followed by the female lead in Ring Lardner's baseball comedy Elmer the Great. With her husband in Boston and Kay becoming a successful stage actress in New York, her long-distance marriage was doomed. 
They divorced during this time, but Kay was never short of wealthy admirers, and her next husband was Alan Ryan Jr., widely considered to be a playboy. She promised him that she would give up the stage, but the allure of the lights and the call of fame was too much for her, and George M. Cohen, who had produced Elmer the Great, helped her get a screen test at Paramount Studios. There she tested opposite Walter Huston, her on-screen partner in her previous play. She was then cast alongside him in her first movie, Gentlemen of the Press, in 1929. After shooting her first film, Kay was then given a relatively small role as a villainess trying to steal a resort for a real estate scheme in the 1929 Marx Brothers film, The Coconuts. This was the first film the public saw her in, and again she was billed as Catherine Francis. Her name appears as the very last name on the cast list. Paramount Movies was impressed enough with these two forays into film acting, and offered her a contract at their main California studios. At the age of nearly 25, she had become a movie star. Before she left New York for the sunshine and fame of California, she met and married Broadway producer John Meehan, but like her last long-distance relationship, it too foundered until her relationship with actor-producer Kenneth McKenna became obvious. She divorced Meehan and married McKenna in 1931, but divorced him a short stormy two years later. Kay swore off nuptials for a while, but continued with her love affairs with the beautiful, the famous and the wealthy, and if rumours are to be believed, with women as well. In the next six years, Kay pumped out more than 21 films that she either had a part in or featured in. For her first Californian film, Dangerous Curves, Kay was billed as Kay Francis for the first time. It was another story in which Kay played the villainess and probably the one that cemented her as the evil other woman. The villainess, the temptress or the wronged woman were parts she was to play over and over again throughout her movie life. She starred mostly as the second lead in this period and where she was cast in movies such as Behind the Makeup, Scandal Sheet, Girls About Town, The False Madonna, and then as the lead in Raffles, where she played her first role as an English woman, whose main role appeared to be looking adoringly, or alarmingly, at Ronald Coleman, her on-screen suitor. But trouble was looming on the horizon. Paramount had had a string of bad pictures, and also had a glut of actresses on its payroll. The studio was in trouble, and at the end of 1932 they let Kay, William Powell and Ruth Catterton move over to Warner Brothers, where they all got pay rises and promises of greater stardom. For Kay, this move was perfect for her career trajectory. Warner Brothers were the second biggest but most successful filmmaking company in Hollywood, and their bread-and-butter films were gritty dramas and suspense-filled crime stories. They had plenty of classy dames to fill the roles in these movies, but they were in need of elegant ladies to star in films aimed directly at depression-weary women, looking for a diversion from the greyness of their lives. Kay got top billing in Warner Brothers movies set in posh apartments, Park Avenue apartments and country estates, where she got to wear the latest fashions, lots of jewellery and plenty of furs. In addition to starring in these lavish movies with better scripts and extravagant budgets, Kay was being paid a whopping $115,000 a year, or $2,200 per week in 1935. Kay was also the highest grossing woman and the sixth biggest money-making star in the country at the time. The years 1930 to 1937 were incredible for Kay Francis. She appeared on 38 national covers and was cast opposite the biggest male stars of the day. She was the most glamorously dressed woman that everyone loved to see in the papers, in magazines and, of course, on the screen. Warner even lent Kay back to Paramount, who made Trouble in Paradise, which became an instant hit, thus raising even more interest in her upcoming films for the company. Her most successful films were filmed for women that were guaranteed to have the audience in tears, movies like I Found Stella Parrish, First Lady and Stranded. Kay started to rebel against the convoluted plots of her weepier type movies. She wanted to be a serious actress and she wanted more money. She felt her salary was disproportional to the amount she was making for the studio. 
After watching Betty Davis go into battle with Jack Warner and get better parts, scripts and budgets, Kay tried the same thing. It didn't go well. Jack Warner was incensed with Kay's attitude, but she was his biggest female star. So as a peace offering, after their discussions, he gave her the leading role as Florence Nightingale in White Angel, a prestigious biopic with a huge expense budget. It should have been amazing. It should have been a success. It was neither. White Angel was a box office flop and set Jack Warner against Kay. Warner began to blame her for any and all losses that the studio incurred. Up until now, Kay's lisp had barely been mentioned, nor a problem, but suddenly it was making its way into the popular press, and the source was Warner Brothers Flax. They began to supply supposed comments and quotes from her fellow cast and crew members that ridiculed her speech impediment. They called her the Wavishing Kay Francis. Then the scriptwriters, presumably under pressure from Jack Warner as well, started adding a lot of words with R's and L's in them, preferably strung together to highlight her lisp. Documents were altered and left lying around for the press to find that claimed Kay was older than her 32 years at the time. Kay had played a lot of women older than she was, and to a cynical public it seemed plausible. Kay's scripts got worse and more ridiculous. Jack Warner seemed hell-bent on ruining her career, even at the expense of his studio and their profits. Finally, Kay rebelled. She threatened to sue the studio if they didn't give her better scripts. Her badgering of Jack the first time around for better roles didn't go well, and this round was really the knockout for her. Jack retaliated by not only demoting her to a B-unit actress, but giving her the worst scripts, next to no budget, and factory hacks as producers. He also made a public announcement of his actions, a move unheard of before, that completed her humiliation. At the same time, the Independent Theatre Owners Association paid for an advertisement in The Hollywood Reporter, citing the list of actors and actresses that they considered box office poison. Yes, Kay was on that list. Other actors and actresses, such as Mae West, Greta Garbo and Marlena Dietrich, appeared on that list too, but they had the backing of their studios, who made sure their next film was a blockbuster, by throwing the best of the best at them, and their careers continued to soar. Kay was working for a company whose owner was actively trying to destroy her. Kay didn't give up. She was on a salary of $2,200 a week, and she wasn't giving that up even if she had to come in and scrub floor every day to earn it, as she wrote in her diaries. It was at this low point that Kay wrote that when her career was finally over, that she hoped her films and negative would be burnt, and the world would forget that she ever existed. In amongst all this turmoil and angst, Kay married a fifth and final time to a complete unknown called Eric Barncow. He quickly disappeared from her life, and it remains unknown if the marriage was ever annulled or if they were divorced at any time. Warner Brothers had to fulfil their contract, and they put her in two more movies, Woman in the Wind and King of the Underworld, where she played opposite Humphrey Bogart in the last of his B-unit movies before his breakthrough to the A-list. Warner Brothers unceremoniously dumped her in 1938 and released the last two movies a year later without her name on the lobby posters or any ads, despite her having the most screen time and being the film's main protagonist. Both films sank without a trace. After her contract at Warner Brothers ended, Kay discovered that no other studio would take her on, and she became an independent actor available on a film-by-film -film basis, for far less money than she was accustomed to. A former cast member, Carol Landis, insisted that she join the cast of In Name Only, where she starred with Cary Grant, but as his vindictive wife. The director was talented, the script fantastic, and the film was well received. In name only is a bit of a cult classic these days for admirers of all three stars. She managed a few more roles, but found that she was increasingly being cast in older woman or mother roles, supporting actor roles, but they were becoming increasingly hard to find. During the war, Kay put her acting life aside and dedicated herself to organising tours of American performers to entertain troops in North Africa. Carol Landis wrote about the experiences and the book, Four Jills and a Jeep, 
was snapped up by Fox Studios, who had Carol and Kay starring as themselves. The film was an unexpected hit in 1944. Despite the success of Four Jills and a Jeep, there were no more offers for Kay, and she then signed a three-picture deal with Monogram Pictures, a very low-quality B-grade studio, and produced and starred in her own productions. They were quite good films despite the very low budget, but Monogram didn't have the cash or the influence to get the movies into country-wide release, and there wasn't the market for ambitious women's movies, with a fading star at the helm. Kay returned to the stage and had a little success with regional touring companies, but in 1948 she was badly injured and her legs scarred in a freak accident involving sleeping pills and a radiator. After that she did a little radio and apparently made two television appearances, all now lost in the mists of time. Kay became a recluse, spending her time on her estate on Cape Cod or in her New York apartment. She had no husband, lover or children, and as far as we know, no living relatives at this time. In 1966, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had a mastectomy, but died on August 28, 1966, alone in New York City. In her diary, Kay had written, When I die, I want to be cremated so that no sign of my existence is left on this earth. I can't wait to be forgotten. Kay's ashes were scattered as per her request at an undisclosed location, and her estate, worth well over a million dollars, was left to her favourite charity, Guide Dogs for the Blind. Hollywood studios were actively working on how to destroy Kay Francis's career. Some actresses did not need any external help. How Barbara Payton destroyed her career in the worst possible way. Watch this video and find out.